Amen. Acts chapter 8. So in Acts chapter 8 so far, uh, the church, you know, has been born. We saw the church begin when the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and those on the upper room, tongues of fire on their head, and the church was born. Something that never happened in the history of the world. A bride was being prepared for Christ. And an amazing thing that, that's happening. And the church, you know, in the first really ten chapters or so of the book of Acts is the church being born, facing all kinds of different difficulties that it faced. We saw uh, deception with Ananias and Sapphira. We saw hypocrisy come into the church. We looked at people who, who didn't care about each other. We looked at issues that were happening in the church. And very much the same as we have churches today spread across America that call themselves Christian churches. Within every one of those you have all the issues that you see in the first ten chapters of the book of Acts. Which is a perfect church. So yet understand that. If you're looking for a perfect church where everybody's happy, everyone's nice, hypocrisy doesn't exist, people really truly care and love each other unconditionally, if you, if you find it, don't join it because you'll ruin it. That's just kind of how it is. <laughs> we're all, we're human beings. And sometimes we forget just how great God's grace is in our lives. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that, you know, it's us that God wants to pierce and change. We always think of the other person, you know, boy, does that person need change. Man, I'll tell you, what, I went to church and you got to see the way they handle and they need to change. God's going, well, I've been talking to you for 25 years. It's you that my word is trying to pierce. It's you're the one that puts the wall of pride up and you won't receive what I have to say. Oh, but you're real quick to point your finger at somebody else. And so we see this in the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts. And a lot of times, different churches take the issues that go on in the first 10 chapters and they apply them as some kind of doctrine for the church. And you can't do that because the church is brand, it'd be like taking a 12 year old that's going from 12 years old to 18 years old and to say, okay, this is how every human being has got to live their life when they're 30. It's like, really? That person's learning from 12 to 18 what it means painfully and sufferingly wise, what it means to be an adult. And there's a lot of skin knees and trials and choices that were right and choices that were wrong that's learned along the way. Imagine if we didn't have the grace of God. All of us would be dead and doomed for eternity in hell. And yet we've been given this fantastic grace of God that we might know him and learn to trust him. And we get down to the book of Acts chapter 8 and what we're going to look at today. We're going to see another issue that comes into the church as it begins to now spread out and reach into the community, uh, the cities around Jerusalem. And it's, it's one that's very common in today's day and age. So I'm going to back up to verse 4 and read about Philip, what David covered last week, just as he goes to Samaria. It says, Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down into the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. This is real important. Philip goes down to Samaria because there's just everybody scattered out. So he goes down to Samaria. Now Samaria is the place the Jews would not go to. The Samaritans are the ones the Jews didn't want to have any dealings with. The Samaritan in, in, in uh, John chapter 4 is the Samaritan woman that Jesus talks to at the well. That nobody, everybody's like, what are you doing talking to this woman? She's a Samaritan. You know, stay away from these people. And yet, when the church is scattered out, you've got to remember, it's scattered like a handful of seed that God takes and spreads out. And one of those seeds was Philip, and he landed in Samaria. And the Samaritans, and here they are. And he goes down, it says he preaches Christ to them. This is really important. It lines up with what our story is about. But preaching Christ to them, it literally means that he told them, he was sharing with them, that the Messiah has come in the flesh. The Messiah, the very ones that we are waiting for, the one that has come to show us the way, has come in the flesh. And they're excited to hear that because there were a lot of false messiahs in Samaria at the time. And we're going to see that this guy Simon was one of them. 
So he tells him, Christ has come, the Messiah has come, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. That hell he's come in the flesh, he's walked among us. We, we talked to him and dealt with him and walked for three years. We watched him die on the cross. We watched him rise again from the dead. And he's empowered us now to go out and proclaim the simple truth. He has come in the flesh, and he is Jesus of Nazareth. Real simple. He's the Son of God. He's alone the Savior of all men. Alone. He is the one who was obedient in his suffering and his death, and he's the one who wrought righteousness and peace and pardon to all people. He's the one, and he's the only one. He's the only way to the Father, and he's made a way, and he's freely given to all, whoever would receive him. So they, they hear this news, and to them, it's fantastic news. It's great news. It says, the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip, and, and they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. It says in verse 7, for in the case of many who had the unclean spirits, they were coming out of them and shouting with a loud voice. Many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, so there was much rejoicing in the city. This is real important, because it lines up with Simon's picture. Look at verse 9. There was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic or sorcery in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they had been giving attention to him for a long time because he had astonished them with his magic arts. But when they Believe Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were being baptized men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed signs and the great miracles that were taking place. And he was constantly amazed. An amazing thing we see here. So you see Philip goes down to Samaria. There's a working of the Spirit of God happening. People who had unclean spirits in them were leaving and shouting with loud voices. There were people being healed. There was much rejoicing. There were paralyzed and lame who could stand up and walk. This is an amazing thing. So you have this guy Simon. He's been down in Samaria as one of the great men there who has the power of God. And amazingly, no one's been healed, no lame have walked, no miracles have happened. But no, he's astonished everybody with his greatness. He hasn't astonished anybody for the glory of God. But he's astonished everybody there with how great he is. It's another issue and problem that the church has faced today. Men who want to be raised up because they believe they have what it takes to do something in the midst of God's people, yet all they want is glory. All they want is a platform. All they want is a name. All they want is someone to give them some kind of power, some kind of authority. And it's a scary thing in, in the day in the church today, and the picture's given to us to see that. Look at verse 9 again. It says, There was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic or sorcery in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Practicing magic here literally means a sorcerer. And if you want to know what that is, you know, in this day and age, not ours, but Jesus's, it literally means one who has at his command demonic spirits and uses them to overpower and charm people deceptively with delight doesn't mean that he sat down at night with his little demons and he knew they were there all it means is he was he was deceiving people for his own personal delight and the deception was demonic spirits that were at his command not that he understood they were at his command but he was just proclaiming to be someone great of God Someone who had a very charismatic way about him, and it was a deceptive way. 
someone who, 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 who began to proclaim before people that he was some kind of great power of God, but yet all he really wanted was, to, was for people to honor him. And so he, had a, he was a sorcerer. And that's, you know, in today's day and age, you got the Harry Potter series, and we have this envisionment of what we think a sorcerer is. But if you want to take it in the limelight of what it was back in Jesus' time, put on your TV and put on some religious channels and watch the guy on TV who's proclaiming something to be from God, and he's manipulating people for money. There's your sorcerer right there. Take off the witch's hat, take off the stars and the stardom, and get down and put the guy naked on there and tell him to proclaim something from God. Because you'll expose him for what he really is, a sorcerer. One who's deceptively being used by demonic spirits to glorify himself. And it's a scary t thing. In today's day and age, there's a lot of demonic deception in the name of Jesus Christ in America today. And you know what's scary? Most people don't agree with it. And yet it was birthed right here, and it happened to the church so we could face it and deal with it the way it needs to be dealt with. And Peter's going to deal with it very powerfully, as we'll see. So he was practicing magic. Says he was astonishing the people, claiming to be someone great. Literally, he was doing amazing things and strange feats that caused the people to admire him. Imagine that. When God is working through a person and they look at the feats that are going on in that person, who are they to admire? God or the person? God. When, when you're doing the labor of God and, and, and people are seeing it for what it is and they come to you and they go, wow, you guys have done a great job in my life here. And you go, you know something? That's the Lord. It is God who has done this. He's opened the door for us to serve you. He's opened the door for me to be a part of this. This is him who gets the glory for this. And real quick, and but a lot of people in today's day and age, they go, well, you know, I just really enjoy helping people. Just really love it. Yep, thank you, I appreciate it. Yep, God's given me this fantastic gifting to go over there and labor for you. All right, yeah, yeah, you just got the glory, man. And God didn't. So he was astonishing people in that way. Claiming to be someone great. Literally it means claiming to be sent by the divine hand of God. This is a guy's shoes I would not want to stand in on judgment day. To stand before people and say, God sent me here to do this for you. And he didn't send them. That is a scary thing. Because there's a lot of that in Christianity today where people come in and they go, oh, God sent me here to say this to you. Hold on now. <coughs> did he? Well, God sent me here to do this for you. Okay, did he? Because <laughs> if he did, it's going to bear fruit for the glory of God and he's going to be honored in this. But if you walk away with the honor and you walk away with the glory, no, he did not send he doesn't send men so that they can receive glory for themselves. No way. That is not the God we serve. He uses broken people so in humility they can lay down their lives in brokenness, give up their will, give up their desires, and accomplish his. So he gets the glory for it. You know, we're told in the word of God that when one sinner repents and comes to Christ, what happens in heaven? There's rejoicing in heaven, amazingly. And let's, let's put that in today's day and age because there's a lot of rejoicing that goes on here on earth and not in heaven because in today's day and age, people don't need to repent anymore. They just, you know, got to have a really good positive message and it's really nice and I walk away happy and I feel good about myself and no, I don't have to turn from my sin. Really. That's a scary place to be. Those are shoes, again, I would not want to be in on that day. I would rather repent for the rest of my life, every day of my life, trusting Jesus Christ by faith than to take any other road. Because that's the call that we've been given. And so here's Simon, he comes in. He's a magician in that day and age. He's a soothsayer. He's practicing divination, I guess you could say, in Jesus' name, claiming to be sent by God. And he's not. 
It says the people were giving attention to him. Um, from the greatest to the least, they were giving attention to him, saying this man is called the great power of God. This term, giving attention to him. So you have the, from the greatest people, like the great, uh, like say the, the Samaritan leaders of the cities, all the way down to the people, the bums that were living on the street. All the people from the greatest to the least were not only were they attentive to the strange things he did, but they were obedient to what he said. And that's scary. That means that wherever Simon went in town, if he was walking by the mayor's house, and he says, and the mayor came out, Simon, the great man of God. Yeah, I know. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. How's, how's your day today, Simon? Oh, it's grand. I just, you know, just wish I had $411 to pay my rent. Boy, I would, this would be great. Oh, what do you need? Well, Simon. Everybody get together, get him $411. Oh, thank you very much. He goes down to the bums in the street. Oh, Simon, oh, oh, you're so great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, except, you know, I'm not, I can't buy new shoes, and I really need new. Oh, well, get Simon's shoes right now. And this is what Simon's life was like. He was a conjurer. He was a soothsayer. He was, he was dead wrong, and he was not sent by God. You know why? Because God takes care of who? His own. You're a servant of the Lord and you need shoes. Guess what God's going to do? You got it. And if you don't need them, guess what he's going to do? You ain't going to get them. And if you need to pay your rent and God says, guess what? He'll take care of it. And you can trust him. Or you go get a job and walk it out. And if, and if he don't want you paying rent that month, guess what? People, oh, wow, well, that's a bad steward, Ron. <laughs> you think so? I serve the Lord completely, and there are times in my life when I was two months behind in my mortgage, trusting God, worrying about what kind of, what kind of picture I'm painting to people, and I'm not a faithful steward with what I get, and yet I'm doing everything I can to trust the Lord and to work and to accomplish what needs to get done. And you know something? God didn't drop one ounce of sweat in heaven. You know what he did? He came through in his perfect timing. And you know what? At the end of it all, I didn't get the glory because I worked so hard to make it happen. He got the glory because it was an absolute miracle how it happened. And God does that in many ways. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples and they go, who made this man born blind? What is his sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus said, neither. That blew their minds. You've got to be kidding me. I've learned my whole life that it was either my sin or my parents' sin that caused me to be this way. And he said, neither. I'll, just, I'll tell you, that man was born blind for the glory of God. You know why? Because today he will see. And he's going to stand before a bunch of Pharisees who are dead blind, and they call themselves leaders of God's children. You watch this. For the glory of God. And that's how it works, and it works that way every time. But here you have Simon in Samaria, and he's, and he's playing a dangerous, dangerous game. <laughs> and the game is, I'm more important, and I need people to think I'm important and to think that I'm something than to even trust God for one second. And that's a scary game to play. In verse 12, or verse 11, you know, they, had, they were giving attention because he had for a long time astonished them uh, with his magic arts. In verse 12, that when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. So Philip came, as we saw in verse 4 and 5 and 6, he came preaching Christ. He preached the true Messiah. I'm telling this is, the, this is the, the one sent by God to be the Savior of all mankind. This is him, Jesus of Nazareth. And when Philip began to proclaim that simple message, so simple, so simple, the people began to believe. And grace began to go out to those who were trusting Jesus Christ. Now, this is an amazing thing. Because what went forth when the people began to believe, was grace. And when grace goes into someone's life, their life changed. Listen, church, real important. 
Because we're a people who can read the Bible all day. We have this unbelievable freedom in America. I can flip it on. I can shut it off. I can do what I want. I can listen to it when I feel like it and shut it off when it offends me. It's real simple. I can do what I want and I can live my life my way here in this country because I have the freedom to do it. And yet God has given us his word in an amazing way and his grace is always right there on the verge for me to receive. But a lot of people talk about receiving God's grace because when you receive his grace, your life changes. If you can sit here today and say, well, I've received the grace of God, and yet you still live in your old ways, you haven't received the grace of God. You verbalized it. You talked about it. That's really great. Yep, yep, yeah, grace of God. Yep, I got it in me, really. If you got it in you, and it's alive in you, it is flowing out to those around you because you can't contain it. And when people come to you that you deem below you, you then put yourself below them because you know how unworthy you are and it's only the grace of God that has kept you alive. If it's alive in you, it's flowing out of you. If it's not, it's not alive in you. It's verbalized. I love God. People do this. I know I do this a lot, right? But there's, like, <laughs> there's people, you know, listen, I hear it all a lot. I love God, and what right do you have to tell me? I have no right at all. But I will speak the truth of God's word in the face of the many Simons that live in the world today. And I will tell you right to your face, it's Jesus Christ, period. You can play all the magical games you want and call upon demonic forces and lean upon the worldly ways that you know, but it's Jesus Christ and Him alone. And when He comes into your life, you never forget it. When He steps in, life is different. And if it's not different, is He living there? Because if He is, then don't go back to your old ways. All you'll do is stumble for the rest of your life. You've been given a brand new life. He's saying, walk in it. I remember talking to this woman in the last couple of weeks, and she came and she's like, well, my son's on drugs again, and, and he really, really needs church. I go, no, no, he needs Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, I know, she says, I know, but he needs church. I'm like, no, the church can't save him. The church cannot heal him. The church is made of broken people who don't have any power within themselves, who are wholly leaning upon Jesus Christ every step of the way. He needs Jesus Christ. She goes, yes, yes, I pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary every day for him. I'm like, no, you're not getting it. It's not going through. It's Jesus he needs. Do you ever talk to someone and they just don't get it? You know, you're talking to them, it's like not going through. You're like, it's not going. It's like the guy that was being interrogated. Remember that story? They come out, they go like, old man, you sign the papers. <laughs> and the guy, I cannot sign the papers. And you're like, you sign the papers. I cannot sign the papers. And they're like, you will, you will sign the papers. Now sign the papers. And he goes, I, I cannot sign the papers. And like, why can you not sign the papers? He says, because you broke my hands. <laughs> like, it ain't going through. <laughs> you can sign them for me. <laughs> it's Jesus. You know what? There are many sorcerers out there. Many Simons. In fact, we get the word Simon. Is it Simonize? Simonize. It means to purchase your position in church for money. And it was birthed through the Catholic Church. You know, we say, oh, well, you know, Peter was the first pope. No, he wasn't the first pope. There were popes that purchased their position. That's not from God. That's not from God. God sends, God directs people to lead his fellowship. They should be people broken and walking in humility. They should be able to sit there and take every shot that's slapped at them and not react back to defend themselves because it's no longer them who lives, but Christ who dwells in them. 
It's no longer a life they're trying to fight or to work out. They've given up and they've surrendered to Christ. But there's a lot of Simons out there in today's day and age. And when you try to talk to them, they don't hear. It's Jesus Christ. So when Philip came down and he preached Christ, he preached freedom from the bondages that they were kept in. Because Simon was there for many years. And nobody was healed, and people were still lame, and people still lived miserable lives. And it's amazing to me today, as, as believers, we can trust Jesus Christ completely. We can do it with our heart, we can do it with our mouth. And we do it with our mouth, and we live our life, and we go, I'm still so lame, I'm still so, I can't be healed, There's nothing's happening in my life. Trust Jesus Christ. I don't even know what that means. It means give up yourself. Lay down your will. God will show you what to do in his word. He's going to tell you, no, 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 don't commit adultery. Stop lying. Don't steal. He's going to say it real clear. No, there's no other God but me that you bow down to. This is walk this way. Oh, it's some law. I have to follow it. No, it's grace. I'll show you how to walk. If you're here today and God has showed you in your life, I don't want that in your life anymore. Change. And you go, you know something? You're such a taskmaster over me. I am not going to do what you say. And you are a very miserable person. But if you sit here and say, Lord, here I am. You died for my sins. You paid the debt for my shame. And I am here to live my life for you. I didn't become a pastor so I could be a religious person. God made me a pastor. And I can, and, and those of you who know me well, you know real well, it's not within me to do this. It is him. He opened the door and I stepped into it and I'm not here accomplishing my will. It's his. And that message goes foreign in today's Christian day and age. And it's a sad thing. We send people to seminary. I call it cemetery. We send people to seminary. You go, yeah, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to be a pastor. Really, did God call you to be a pastor? Well, I believe that he did. Really? Really? So you're going to go to Bible college. You're going to learn all that you need to know so you can come back and apply that and be a pastor when maybe God, if he did call you to be a pastor, maybe it's brokenness he wants in your life, not an exaltation of some kind of thing you can put on the wall so people can give you a name, simony. Scary thing. Now, if you're called by God to be a pastor, Bible college is a cool thing to get some tools to learn to teach the word. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you'll know if you're called by God because you'll be loving his people. You'll be serving his people. You'll be giving up. You won't be fighting for your rights anymore. But here's Simon in, in a scary way. You know, uh, people were astonished by him. But when Philip came and began to preach Christ, everybody turned from Simon and began to be baptized. They began to say, hey, this is a different way, and I'm watching my family members healed. I'm watching people's lives changed, and it's never happened before. We are trusting Simon. I'm trusting Jesus Christ, and I'm going to trust him and walk with him, this thing that Philip is sharing with me. And I'm going to walk this out amazingly. Uh, verse 13, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Amazing. There were people, they were pro making professional professions of faith in Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is, literally. They weren't going in to be saved, to be baptized. They were, baptism was a profession of faith. When you went from one religious way and you were going to change and convert to another, the baptism part was a profession of what you were doing. And so when people were baptized, it was a profession of their faith. It, the Jewish nation had baptism. Nobody else had it. And the Jews would go, they'd be baptized. If they were going to go ceremonial, would be clean. They would be baptized for many different reasons. So when Christ came onto the scene and, and, and the apostles were sent out to proclaim Christ, people were being baptized. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to be. The thief on the cross wasn't. He went to paradise. Many of the martyrs were not. Many of them. 
Baptism is just it's, it's, a, it's some, an ordinance of the church, not an ordinance of God. And baptism is real simple. You're going into that water and you're saying to everybody publicly, I am dying to myself here and I'm crossing the Jordan and I'm leaving behind the law and I'm going to walk out this spirit-filled life. I stand before all people, and I go down into the water, and I come back up, and I'm no longer going to be the person I was. I make this public profession of faith to all people. That's baptism. It's real simple. And you get up, and you start walk. I've been pastor for a long time and serving in churches for a long time. I've never seen anybody get up out of the water and be filled with the Spirit and walk around different for the rest of their life. But I have seen people come up out of that water and say, I'm leaving the old person behind. I'm not going to go back to my room or to my apartment or to my house and do the same things I was doing yesterday because that person's gone. And I have a brand new life to walk, a brand new life to live. And so people were doing that. So Simon himself believed and was baptized. An amazing turn of events here. Uh, literally, he made a profession of faith. He was baptized along with everybody else. Yet it says that he continued on with Philip. It doesn't mean he became Philip's companion. It means he tagged along to watch how Philip was doing these miracles. He was like, I got to see what he's, what this guy is really all about. You know, how's he pulling this one off? I got to watch how he does that. Something's here that I don't see. Something I'm not understanding. So he watched him kind of watch everywhere he went. He watched, how did he heal that guy? What did he use? What kind of powder did he put in his drink? What's this guy all about? And he followed Philip for that reason, literally waiting to see where his power came from because he was seeing great miracles take place and he was constantly amazed. Verse 14, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. This is really important. Jerusalem heard and found out that, that the Samaritans had received the word of God. Now, this is, this is important. What they received was the preaching of Jesus Christ. And what was heard in Jerusalem was that they received the word of God because the preaching of Christ is the word of God. The Logos, the very breath of God. This is my beloved son. Trust him. This is my beloved son. Look to him. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to go back and, uh, and walk through your word. I'm going to accomplish and follow all your rules and regulations because that's what you want of me now in Christ. And God's saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. This is the word of God. This is my son who gave his life for you that you might have life abundantly, literally, that you might no longer be bound and chained to what held you down, that you might be freed from the way you used to live your life, and you might begin to walk this brand new life now. How many people do you know that hold on to the past with everything they got, especially when somebody does something wrong to them like 15 years ago? You talk to somebody, oh, this guy, he did this to me, they did it to me. And they're like, well, when did this happen to you? Oh, about nine, ten years ago. You're like, what? what? Are you kidding me? What happened to Christ and what happened to grace? What happened to the past is forgiven. Christ is walking, you walk with him now, and he's secured in your, your future. Why are you in the past? Why are you living your life where you ought not to be, God doesn't remember it. That's his promise. You've been given a brand new life. Walk in it. Leave yesterday behind. You know why? It's gone. Out of all the people in the world that you know, who can pull up yesterday? Out of all the people you know, there's some great people out there, powerful people. They got to pull. They know people in high places. They're like, I got people in high places. Yeah, okay, ask them to pull up yesterday. So you can go back and relive it and change the way things happen. You'll never find someone who can do it. You know why? Because yesterday's gone. And we've been given this fantastic grace where God's mercies are new every day. And he's saying, let it go. Leave it alone. Put it behind you. 
Look at how it stumbles your day every single day. Look at how it beats you into the ground and then you take it out on everybody else. Put it behind you. You got a brand new life. Go live it. Imagine, you know, I have the representation of a caterpillar and a butterfly. Or as you're a caterpillar, you just crawling across the ground. You're like, I am just the most beautiful thing. You look in the mirror, you're like, yeah, what is that? I am this thing, man. And then you realize, this is horrible, Lord. I need your help. He takes you and he puts you in this little cocoon. You're like, what are you doing to me? I need help. There's help I need. You're wrapping me up and I'm tightly bound. And this thing, it's horrible. God's like, just wait. Just wait. And one day it breaks open and what comes out? What comes out? An ugly caterpillar? No, a brand new life that's got beauty in it. A beauty that God created. And he's given you and I a brand new life. And we sit there and we go, Lord, it's such a caterpillar. And he's like, no, you're a butterfly now. And you're like, but I'm such a caterpillar. And he's like, no, you're a butterfly. Leave the caterpillar in the cocoon and launch out into the brand new life that you've been given. And for some reason, it's really hard to do, isn't it? You know why? Because we get taken captive by the Simons of the world who bring us back, who take us back where we don't belong. And we are here to step forward every day of our life in Christ. Just, just an amazing thing. So Peter and John come down and says, when they had prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit, verse 16, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had been simply baptized, been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. This is an amazing thing. They had trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in their lives. They had received the Holy Spirit of conversion. You know, when you get saved, you receive the Spirit of God inside your heart. The second you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, God's Spirit comes into you. Period. You're sealed in salvation. Done. It's done. Sealed. Then there's a time that the Spirit comes upon you, and that's the empowerment for service. And what they had not received was the empowerment for service. They had received salvation. Philip's there. They had received salvation. He had been there for quite some time. This is not just a one-day event. This happened for a long time before Peter and John were sent down, because Jerusalem had to hear what was going on. And when they came there, they were like, okay, you know, who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Where's the work, where's the labor of the ministry? We see people, they're saved, and lives have changed, and that's really great, but who's serving one another in love? Who's walking out the, the work of the ministry? No one is. Then, then, then there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that needs to come out. That's the empowerment for service. And in today's day and age, it's so wacky. I mean, I'm going to get letters for this, but I get they'll matter. So many people in today, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Man, you need to get a life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you want to know that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will be serving God in ministry in some way, shape, or form, and you will not be doing it for your glory because it will no longer be you alive in you, but Christ in you. And if you're still the king or queen of your throne, you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've received the Spirit of God the day you got saved. Maybe you've been given the gift of tongues. Use it for the glory of God. But don't connect the two. Because Scripture does not teach that. Scripture teaches you, baptism in the Holy Spirit is for the empowerment of service. If you've been baptized in the Spirit, you will be serving God somewhere. Because your life will no longer be about you. You will pour it out for God's Children, you'll give your life for them. You'll pour your life out for them. You'll give up every ounce of your being. If you have a retirement, you won't care about it anymore because you're going to heaven for eternity. 
If you have somewhere you're going in your life and you're trying to advance there, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will no longer walk that way. You'll change direction because you will have eyes and ears and a heart that's alive to serve the Lord and His people. One of my prayers for this whole area is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I ain't looking for people to speak in tongues like 99% of all other people that are praying for that. I'm looking for the empowerment of service where people begin to pour their lives out for one another. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when Peter and John came down, they saw everybody saved, lives are changing. That's, what, that's great. But who's serving? Who's pouring their life out for the glory of God? Nobody. Well, then let's lay hands on them and so they can begin to pour their lives on and they receive the Holy Spirit very powerfully. In fact, verse 17, they began laying hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Scary thing. Uh, verse 18 and 19 saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is being received by people. There's an empowerment for service. There are people now in Samaria who are no longer driven by self and for selfish gain, but they're driven by God for the glory of God in the labor of the Lord. And Simon saw this. And he watched it happen, and he began to say, hey, I want this power, you know, so he could see people were changing. He could see people were no longer needing him. He could see that they were empowered to begin to labor in the Lord. Imagine if you're like a psychologist, and you've got somebody that's coming in every week to see you, and they sit down on your couch, and, and they pour everything out, and you tell them, oh, take two of these, and go see this, and walk that, and then you know you're going to get another 85 bucks next week, so you just keep it going. And it's like circular reads, it never ends. And they come to know Christ, and they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Guess where they're not going to go next week? To your couch they're going to go, I don't need your couch, man. There are people in the church out there that I am going to serve. Amen. There are people out there that I'm going to pour my life out for because I am no longer living this for myself and I sat on your couch for 10 years worried about self. Yeah. And Simon's in this place and he's, and he's like, "Where's I need this power. And what he wanted was an authority over the people. Peter and John didn't come down as an authority over the people. They came down below the people as apostles, as ambassadors of Christ, sent by God to, to hand Christ out to everybody they saw. And they came in that way. And here's Simon. He's like, hey, I want this, man. I want what they, I don't want what they got. I want to be able to give them what they got. He doesn't say to Peter and John, I need this empowerment in my life. I believe God wants me to serve him. He doesn't say that. He says, give me what you got so I can give them what I think they want. Make me look good in front of these people. That's all I care about. And that's all Simon was all about. And he says, and I'll give you money you know, he offers them money so that he might go around and lay his hands on people that they could receive his spirit. And again, you know, he doesn't ask them to lay their hands on him, which I think Peter would love to do. You know, I'll lay my hands on you, Simon. No, that's not what it's about. It's not about money. He wants to have the glory in the eyes of men. And in, in 20, Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. He says, You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Verse 23, he says, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. And Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. 
So in verse 20 again, Peter says to him, may your silver perish with you because you think you can purchase this gift of God with money. An, an amazing thing. What it means literally is Peter's kind of saying, don't be so quick to hasten your life to ruin. Let your money perish. Because what you think you can purchase with money, if you think you can purchase this gift of God with money, you're going to spiral downward real fast. Let your money perish. Because you cannot purchase the gift of God with money. It cannot happen, and it's not going to happen. You know, do you actually think you can purchase the gifts that God bestows upon those who believe and trust in Him with money? There's no way. When God pours out His Spirit upon a person, it is they, if they've received Christ, they've received the Spirit, then there's an outpouring. And if He pours His Spirit out upon someone, it's for the service of the ministry. The first thing you're going to see different in your life is you're going to love unconditionally. Immediately, right away. Because you have received that love. You're going to pour grace out where grace never happened before. Your life's going to change. And Simon's like, I want this so I can, I can hand it out. And Peter says, no, that'll perish. That money you think you're going to purchase, it's going to spiral you downward. You can't buy the gift of God with an income. Verse 21, he says, You have no power to portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. What Peter says to him is, You will neither share nor have allotted to you any part of this divine expression of Christ, for your heart is twisted within itself, or literally, your heart is, is wholly consumed with you. Peter says, I am not here for myself, and John is not here for himself, and Philip's not here for himself. He says, but I can see that you are all about you. And you will have no part in this because you think you can purchase this with money. You're still all wrapped up within yourself. And you cannot have this. Peter tells him boldly, this is love here. You know, we say, speak the truth in love to one another. We're told that, right? And what do we think when we hear that? We go, be kind and nice to each other. And don't offend anybody with your words. Do you know that sometimes love offends? My father loves me. Do you know that my, my, my father loves me so much? When I was a little kid and I burnt the couch down, you know what he did to my rear end? Because he loves me. This is because he loves me. He did what I thought wasn't love. And you know, my Father in heaven loves me enough is that when I'm here and I burn the couch down by mistake, He loves me enough to tan me. And I know now that that's love. And that sometimes, you know, some of you know that come in for counseling with me, you know, I, I'm not picking sides. I, it ain't going to happen. You know, come in. Stop. God loves you. This is his word. He doesn't bend it. I tell wife, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Hey, you don't know the guy. You don't know him. I know him. Tell the husband, love your wife like Christ loves you. You don't know her. You don't get her. I'm human. I understand. Believe it or not. God's word doesn't change. Love her. Submit as unto the Lord. Not the world's way, in the way of Christ. And this is how it's done. And love conquers a multitude of what? Sins. And it will do that for eternity. And that's an amazing thing there. So Peter says to him, you know, all that you do has never been for God's people, but for yourself. Your heart is still centered around you, not them. You can't lay hands on somebody and hand this give out because gift out, you're still consumed within yourself. And you cannot have that. You cannot be that. And you have no part in this. And, and he says to him in verse 22, Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Amazingly, repent. Real simple. Repent means think differently. 
Stop thinking the way you're thinking. Think differently. You go, hmm, I don't know if I can do that. That's not the question, and that's not the answer. That's the human response to get around it, isn't it? Well, I'm thinking about that, and it's going to be really hard for me to do. God didn't ask you to think about it. He said, think differently. Let it go and begin to think his way. You know, we all get opinions. You know, I was thinking about that. My view on this is, stop right there. Think differently. Begin to think his way. Think differently. Oh, what's his way? Not the way you're thinking. It's real simple, right? That's, that's it. Change it. Think differently. Repent. If God says, this is sin, and I go, well, it's sin for them, but for me, it's liberty in Christ. And God says, it's sin. You go, think differently. Repent. If you say it's sin, then it's sin for everybody and for me. And I think differently about it. I'm no longer going to say, well, I have the freedom in Christ to do this, because that's not the question. The question is, will I repent? He says, repent of your wickedness. That's an amazing picture that's painted there. You know, <laughs> reconsider the piercing of your heart that's needed in your life. Reconsider the way you think your heart needs to be pierced. Because God, in the teaching of his word, knows where your heart needs to be pierced. You know what I'm very thankful of, being the pastor of this church? I don't know where your heart needs to be pierced. You could ask the guy, I'm not in my office going, Ah, oh, there's Rich, yeah, there's Kirsten, yeah, I'm going to put this in there. Where's Mark? Oh, I'm putting that down too. Oh, yeah, i got to get them all. And who else? Uh, Ernie, yeah, i got to put it in there. Yeah, yeah, I have no clue. And I'm very thankful for that because I know it's not me. And if you're here and your heart's pierced by the word of God, then, and, then if he's showing you something, change, rethink differently in this, repent of this, then, then you stop and you go, okay, all right, Lord, literally, I'm going to reconsider the piercing of my heart that's needed in my life. You're piercing my heart with your word, and I can't keep going around it back to what I think. I have to receive it for what it's worth. You're piercing me here in my life. And I have to think differently about this. I have to change the way I think about it, change my opinion on it, and line it up with yours. And it's real simple. That's what Peter says to Simon. Just reconsider this. That piercing is very important. When there's a teaching of God's word, if there's not a piercing of the heart somewhere, somehow, it's not a teaching of God's word. You can sit down and have a Bible study all day and laugh and joke and it's real fun. We can get up and walk away and sing hallelujah and kumbaya and go home and we're done. But when God's word is taught, there's a piercing that happens. It happens to me when I'm studying it. it happens to me a lot. And it should happen to every one of us where the word goes out there and God does conviction and it pierces and he's like, and you go, thank you, Lord. Again, you've exposed my need for your son. You've exposed my need to turn from this and be forgiven and to trust you wholly in this. What grace, what fantastic grace we have for that to happen in our lives. You know, if we didn't have grace for that, as soon as there was a piercing, we'd be dead. Because God would pierce and go, ah, you broke my word. You're done. Oh, to be nobody in church. You know, like, come on to Calvary Chapel where you can die. It's like, no. With this life in Christ, when the piercing happens and I see there's the cross, there's the blood of my Savior who's covered my life. Jesus, thank you for giving me a brand new life and still being willing to pierce this wretched heart of mine that you find yourself at home in. Amazing. Unbelievable. So Peter says to Simon, he says, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray, you know, that if it's possible that the Lord, you'll be forgiven of it. And he says, verse 23, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of 
iniquity. This is pretty wild. Peter says, it's very apparent to me, maybe not to you, he's saying, but Simon, it's very apparent to me that you are in the gall of bitterness. Literally means you have a malignant, bitter heart. Translation, your heart is always dragging up the past and condemning the future. You have a, you're in the gall of bitterness. There's bile in your heart, and it's evil, not good. Because all you can do is reach back to the past and drag it up so that you can condemn the future. You know, here's Simon saying, I love Jesus. I am here to serve Jesus. I am here to serve the Lord. I'll give me that power so I can give it to other people. I'll pay you for it. And yet deep inside his heart, he can't stop digging up the past. You know, that guy did me wrong. Hey, I want to hand out the Holy Spirit to somebody. Oh, that guy did me so wrong. I hate that guy. Oh, I despise him. You know, it just it burn, it's like bitters up. And Peter says, it's, it's, maybe it's not evident to you. And sometimes when we're in the gall of bitterness, we're the last ones to see it. It's always some, usually if you're married, it's your husband or your wife. And you, you go into the other room, you're like, man, she's in the gall of bitterness. You know? Oh, man, he's in the gall of bitterness today. Yeah, it's, you know, like, it's your heart. It's a heart issue. And he says, in your heart, man, there's a malignant, bitter, sour, selfish thing. And you can't have this because this is what you're all about. And this is what you need to go before God and repent and change here. Let God come in and, and take you, you know, a heart that will never let go of yesterday and it ends up deceiving itself into tomorrow. Man, that's not the place to live. And he says, and in the bondage of iniquity, this is wild, the bondage of iniquity, it means you're being held captive by the cords of sin. Literally, you won't let go of the past when God has already forgiven you of it, so it's consuming you and holding your heart captive to sin. You know how many people in today's Christian day and age are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity? They say, I love the Lord, I am here to serve Him, but I can't let go of this thing, and I can't let go of that thing. And, it's, and then all of a sudden, it, it begins to take me captive, and I'm being held, I can't, I don't know why I continue to sin. And I'm trying not to, because you're held captive by the cords of it, because you won't let go of the past. You're, you're dragging it up to condemn the future. And Peter says, and that's where you're at. And, and, and amazingly, you know, Simon doesn't believe it. Amazingly, Simon's like, you pray for me that none of this happens to me. And Peter's like, what do you mean? It's happening to you right now. You asking me to pray for you so this doesn't come upon you. And I'm trying to tell you that right now, before me, you're in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. And you're asking me to pray for you so it doesn't happen. He goes, you're there. That's an amazing thing. And he's taken captive by him. See, so some people are so consumed within themselves, they can't see past themselves. <laughs> and you know what's amazing? In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, who lived that kind of life and then met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and then spent many, many years struggling through what that relationship was all about, years later would say to the church in Ephesus, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed until the day of redemption. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind-hearted to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Real simple word. You're no longer the person you were. God has given you a brand new life. Stop going back to the past. Imagine what would happen if every one of us in this fellowship would face the cross of Jesus Christ with true honesty and say, okay, am I living in the gall of bitterness and I'm in the bondage of iniquity? And I have to let go of my past that you, my Lord, have forgiven. 
And I have to begin to walk this brand new life that you've given me and walk it out every day of my life. And I have to take in my life, which is alive, bitterness, and I have to let it go. Wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, I have to put it away from me. All malice. And I have to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as you have daily forgiven me. There is no greater way for a believer to walk. In fact, walking that out, you're fulfilling all that God has put in his law. You're putting him first. You're putting you last. You're putting others first. You're putting you low. You're loving instead of hating. You're laying down that which is idolatrous, and you're putting on Christ each and every day. You know, Paul records, what he records, he records from his own broken life saying, walk this way, live this way. It's grace that has been extended out. Let it, let it be given to you. So again, in verse 24, you know, it says, Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourself so that nothing of what you have said may come upon you. So he doesn't even get it. He's at this place and he's just like, pray that this doesn't happen to me. And Peter's like, it's happening to you right now. And it's an amazing thing to me when I look at it. When I, when I see this story, I think of two things. Sorcery or empowerment? Now, sorcery, am I accomplishing my will, literally? Am I trying to deceive people without even realizing it through demonic power so that I can prove to them that I'm someone great and I can have glory? That's sorcery. Or empowerment. Empowerment is doing the labor of the Lord through the empowering of His Spirit for His glory. Every one of us in this room, we're believers. We believe Jesus died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He paid the debt for our sin. Praise God for that. But what are you empowered by? Is it sorcery? Are you still living the old life? Are you still trying? Are you worried about what people think of you? Worried about what someone looks at you? Worried about you got to put on a face so you can look good in front of people? Or are you just empowered by his spirit to serve one another in love? Because there's two ways here. There's Simon's way, which is false. And there's God's way, which is the empowerment of his spirit. I believe God wants every believer empowered by his spirit so that we can serve one another in love. So that we can go out into our communities and begin to show people, you know something, God loves you. And they go, no, he can't love me. I'm so bad. I'm so wretched. You don't know where I've been in my life. And we go, let me tell you something. I know where you've been because I've been there too. And he loves me. And he loves you. Or we go out there empowered by sorcery and we go out and tell everybody how bad our life is. I'm so miserable because this and this past and last year, this and last when I was 19, this guy, I'm like, whoa. How are you living your life? Sorcery or empowerment? God wants to empower you so you can accomplish his will and you'll be settled in the fact that you know you're doing it. You know what it takes? It takes a humble heart. It takes a broken life that willing to come before God and say, Lord, I desperately need you to empower my life. Then go to the leaders of the church. Not that they have anything special, because they don't. But we'll lay hands on you. Some of you will lay hands on pretty well. You know, no, we'll, we'll lay hands on you. You want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if he's going to empower you or not. But you want to be empowered by his spirit. You, gotta, you have to believe. Your heart's got to be right. I tell you that. You got to be willing to stand before the cross and say, where am I at? Gall of bitterness, bondage of iniquity, or wholly trusting my Savior. Where am my heart at? And where your heart's at, you'll, you'll see that empowerment because God will give it to you. But he doesn't empower a heart that's wrapped up within itself. And there's a picture given. So here's the, the early church, you know. We look at it and go, I want to be just like the church in the book of Acts. They, they had some problems, man. There were some issues going on. But they were given to us to see, so that our eyes might be open, that we can face the same issues every single day, and we can trust Jesus Christ through them all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to walk through your word. 
And Lord, I ask that you would take your word that was taught today, that you would plant it deep in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would empower this fellowship, Lord, to do the work of the ministry, to begin to be empowered by your Spirit in the labor of the Lord. I pray that your grace would continue to see us through, that we would look towards your Son as we face the challenges in our life each and every day. And let your word be planted deep in our hearts. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit, that it might bear fruit for your glory and your perfect timing. Have your way in us and through us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.